Better late than never. Oopsie, the worst rapper alive. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Big Mac's back on the mic like oops. Back on the horse, still jumping through hoops. I'm missing Lincoln Pink, I don't lip sync. Just to be clear, choking isn't my kink, but I do it anyway sometimes, I guess. Gotta laugh now, die later in my times of stress. I'm blessed, feeling good, charged up like a Hadouken. Multazita Banakesi, welcome into the Worst Wrestling Podcast. Sorry, we are a day late and a dollar short. Uh, dealing just with a bunch of shit uh, this weekend. Um, I Basically, I'm going through a move, but not really. It's kind of complicated, but my wife had her residency approved from USA to Canada, and with everything going on in the U.S., perfect fucking timing, eh? Uh, but for reals, uh, so she's going through a move. She's moving to Canada. We got the house uh, set up and everything. I still have another year left on my lease where I'm at now, also because my daughter's going to school here still. It's French school. It's Quebec, different than Ontario. It's a whole th- shebang of bang. So, bottom line, I was in Ontario uh, <laughs> on Friday uh, dealing with all the house issues. And uh, by the time I got home on Friday, I was so worn out that Saturday I just literally had to take the day off. So, apologies. There was no live yesterday. Uh, but I thought I would come back, get you guys with a bonus episode. And we are doing top 10 SummerSlam matches. Uh, with SummerSlam just around the corner, I thought it would be fun to look back. These, I want to be very clear, are not like a official top 10 of what I think are just like the best SummerSlam matches. If I was writing an article or whatever, these are my favorites, you guys. These are my top 10 favorite SummerSlam matches. It was hard even just putting them in order, uh, but um, I did it worst to first. Uh, and We'll start right off, speaking of the worst, Kurt Angle versus Stone Cold Steve Austin for the WWE title in 2001. So, the story of why this is so low on this list, because normally that would have been like my number one match. You talk about Stone Cold and The Rock were like my guys, obviously, growing up in 1996 in the Attitude Era. And when Kurt Angle came along, initially, I hated him. But he was just so damn good that he won me over. And this was around the time that they were doing the Alliance stuff where uh, Kurt Angle came out with the milk truck and sprayed down the Alliance, which I thought was hilarious, especially because it was an homage to the beer truck in Austin. So by this time... I'm a huge Kurt Angle fan, and Kurt Angle was hugely over by this point. He was a baby face, and Stone Cold was actually the heel in this match. Um, Stone Cold was, like, the leader, or he had made, like, the deal with Vince McMahon to fuck over Rock at WrestleMania, so this was uh, post-Stone Cold heel run. Uh, And uh, this was also at a time where I think he was leading the Alliance, Uh, So it was confusing times with Stone Cold being a heel and Kurt Angle being the face. Uh, But the match itself was fantastic. It's just the the end was so fucking stupid because Austin just kept knocking refs out left, right, and center. And then eventually Angle uh, hits an angle slam and he's got him in the ring, one, two, three, but there's no ref to count. And uh, the Alliance ref, Nick Patrick, comes down to the ring. And instead of doing the, instead of like continuing to count, he disqualifies Stone Cold for uh, having beat up all the other referees, and that's the end of the match. And then Kurt Angle kind of beats the shit out of uh, Nick Patrick, goes crazy, gets a huge pop, but ultimately Stone Cold keeps the title. And it was, it was one of those fucky finishes that I really hated from the Vince McMahon era, where it was like. Bro, just have Nick Patrick come out, and he doesn't do the count. Angle tries to go uh, beat the shit out of him, but Austin swerves, intercepts, and give me a clean finish. Like, I hate – there's nothing I hate more than a fantastic match with a non-finish. 
Uh, and that's why for me, even though this is like, I always, when I think of SummerSlam, it's actually one of the first matches I always think of is Kurt Angle versus Stone Cold because the match itself was spectacular. Arguably Stone Cold's best match wire to wire, you know, besides uh, the Bret Hart match. Um, but the finish was fucking bad. Uh, number nine, nine holds a special place in my heart. I mentioned before, I grew up during the Attitude Era in 1998. You had the ascension of Triple H and The Rock leading their two factions of Degeneration X and The Nation. And it culminated in a ladder match for the Intercontinental Championship at SummerSlam. Uh, and uh, Triple H would go over in this match from what I remember. This is a long ass time ago. And I was going to rewatch all these before I did this, which I probably should have done. But it wouldn't be the worst wrestling podcast if I was prepared, you guys. So I'm just going purely off memory for all of these. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh. So, yeah. Uh, this was, again, like uh, a culmination, it felt like, of Triple H and The Rock's characters and very much, uh, um, you know, kind of cemented them as, like, the next main event guys. And just going back to, again, the Attitude Era and the Attitude Wars, the, war, uh, the Monday Night Wars, sorry, between WWF and WCW, this is what helped WWF win, was them building characters like The Rock and Triple H in lieu of, uh, you know, pushing down their main characters. They were actually building them up to be the next main event stars after losing, you know, Kevin Nash and uh, those kind of guys. Uh, but yeah, uh, number eight, John Cena versus Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship in 2013. So this was in the thralls of the Daniel Bryan Yes era uh, when he was uh, against the authority and being called a B-plus player. Um, but yeah, this was... One of uh, John Cena's best matches before John Cena kind of had that run uh, with AJ Styles um, and had a couple other really classic matches. This was probably John Cena's best match. And he put Daniel Bryan over clean, which was incredible. And, uh, and then you had the huge turn at the end where Triple H, Pedigrees, Daniel Bryan, and Randy Orton comes out and cashes in the money in the bank, and it leads all the way to the WrestleMania triple threat where Daniel Bryan gets the title back in spectacular fashion, one of the greatest WrestleMania uh, matches of all time, and partly because of the build. And it wasn't just the build to uh, from SummerSlam to WrestleMania, which was already crazy, but it was the build all the way to SummerSlam. Like this... I don't think sometimes I feel like people forget that this was a culmination point already when you had Daniel Bryan being coronated and beating John Cena, the franchise player, just to get fucked over by Triple H and create the, the authority angle and really cement that. And then you had Daniel Bryan versus the authority all the way through WrestleMania. Like this could have been honestly higher on the on my list but i felt like uh it's appropriately placed because of i'm just trying to rank the match itself like let's just go bell to bell the the match is over and daniel bryan has won and then kind of set the rest aside hard to do but honestly the rest of these matches are are so good anyways um but yeah this honestly again i i had a lot of trouble placing these this could have been as high as three or four for me, honestly. Um, but we'll get into number seven. CM Punk versus Brock Lesnar in 2013. 
So this was one of CM Punk's last matches uh, before leaving WWE. Uh, and this was at a time where Brock Lesnar had returned from the UFC and was a very dominant figure in uh, WWE. And uh, what was so great about this, too, was it was two Paul Heyman guys, right? Paul Heyman being the manager of Brock Lesnar at this time uh, and formerly associated, obviously, with CM Punk. CM Punk being a Paul Heyman guy. So you had that added uh, angle to the match. But... Uh, and again, crazy that this was also in 2013, the same year of John Cena versus Daniel Bryan. So what a SummerSlam that was in 2013. Underrated 2013 is potentially one of the best SummerSlams of all time. But I digress. Uh, the actual match between CM Punk and Brock Lesnar was like an instant five-star classic. This was one of the first times, too, of where Brock Lesnar really sold and did well working with a smaller opponent, which would yield matches in the future with AJ Bryan, uh, AJ Bryan. I'm mixing literally the two names, uh, AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan aforementioned. Um, so like kind of those uh, match styles and the way they build those types of matches, really a lot of it comes from CM Punk. Again, Credit to Phil where credit is due. He is one damn good wrestler. Uh, and he was an innovator in his time, especially at a time where um, through 2009 to 2013 were some dark fucking times for WWE. Uh, and 2013 was really them coming out of it for two. It was the combination of Brock Lesnar and then the reignition of the Daniel Bryan uh, era. Those two things, again, you talk about the way that they kind of coincided. It's crazy that uh, to think that Daniel Bryan and Brock Lesnar together really kind of saved WWE in an era where, um, and you know, John, again, John Cena, for a lot of people, they say he carried it through dark times. John Cena, to me, and to a lot of fans, almost killed WWE because he was so forced down our throats, um, and it became such a PG era, and a lot of, again, like the worst times that I remember myself as a wrestling fan like was like 2009, 10, and 11, where I just wasn't, I wasn't invested at all. Um, like usually, like usually at my worst, I'm watching the pay-per-views at that point. I just was completely out as a fan altogether, which had never happened to me before in my life. Um, but yeah, it's crazy to think that Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan had these two stellar SummerSlam matches that would then lead all the way to WrestleMania where they would again coincide. That was the same WrestleMania 30 where, Brock Lesnar would break the Undertaker's streak and Daniel Bryan would defeat Batista and Randy Orton in the infamous triple threat match to win the WWE Championship. So crazy how they kind of go together hand in hand. But yeah, getting back to the actual match, CM Punk versus Brock Lesnar 2013 was one hell of a match. Uh, I think this one, underrated on most lists, but highly rated in the eyes of fans. I think fans would agree with me that a, a very deserving number six, Christian versus Randy Orton for the World Heavyweight Championship in 2011. It was a no-holds-barred match. And this was arguably, at the time, one of, the, one of Randy's greatest matches. This, still to this day, is arguably Christian's greatest match and achievement on a main stage. Uh, again, fantastic, fantastic match all the way through. Uh, two incredible Hall of Fame workers, in my opinion. Um, and Randy did end up going over, and uh, that was at a time where he was, again, the face. It was between – the title basically just flipped back and forth forever between Randy and John Cena at that time. They were the two really carrying the company during – even though I called those dark times, like, you know, Randy was doing some of his best work and John John 
was doing John things. Um, so it's funny because I feel like fans remember that era very differently depending on how old you are. Because there's, I know lots of younger fans that are, that think of, of that era fondly. Uh, and to me, the, that's uh, probably the worst era that I can remember in wrestling was. But then Brock came back and changed everything, honestly. When Brock came back from UFC, I came back as a fan because I was so invested in the idea of Brock Lesnar, who was already like crazy over when he was in WWE. Him coming back and being legitimized by having, even though he didn't technically succeed in um, the NFL, he he made a roster uh, for like a preseason or whatever it was before he got cut. Like he made it further than a lot of guys. And, uh, and then he obviously was a former UFC heavyweight champion. And the way that they used that when he came back was just incredible in terms of like, you want to talk about reigniting kayfabe. And then it coincided, like I said, with, also, I found out about Daniel Bryan at the same time, and then all of a sudden, I had two things to really latch on to between Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan. And again, I was, I that's when I really became reinvested uh, as a fan of professional wrestling. And since then, I have stayed at the very least, like I said, where it's like I'll always watch all the pay per views for the most part. Um, I but uh, even late, like. Uh, there's been ebbs and flows of where I'll try and follow even the weekly programming. Obviously, since I've started this show, I've been watching a lot more too. Um, but yeah, getting to number five on the list, the unsanctioned match between Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Yo, this match was fucking unhinged. And uh, I was like the perfect age for it too, where I was 12 years old. I really bought into the kayfabe um, of uh, you know the this big rivalry between two former best friends, and because Triple H at that time, I think people forget almost Triple H is run as just a crazy fucking like the worst kind of heel. Like he has so much heat back then, the cerebral assassin. Um, but man, this match in particular, uh, some of the stuff they did. Uh, the way Sean came out in just the jeans and the cowboy boots, uh, but also the way Triple H hit him in the back with the sledgehammer at the end, that shit was gnarly. And because of all the, the history of the back injuries, like my, that this was honestly, um, of all their matches that they ever had uh, against each other, to me, this stands far and above easily as my favorite. Um, when I think of Triple H versus Shawn Michaels, I always think back to SummerSlam and this, the unsanctioned match. Uh, this was easily my favorite, like I said, my favorite match that they ever had together. Uh, at number four and number three. So I kind of just jam these ones together a little bit. And I will say these are ones I would definitely have to watch back because this was like, these are like earliest childhood memories of wrestling. This is like when my dad was showing me wrestling to get me into wrestling. These were some of the matches that he was showing me. Um, and especially because, you know, growing up in Canada, there's only one. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Brett the Hitman Hart. Um, and so we start with actually the WWE title match against his brother, Owen Hart. Uh, and again, just, I mean, anytime Brett and Owen were in the ring together, uh, it was absolutely magical. Uh, but this was a culmination of their feud inside a steel cage at SummerSlam. Uh, and it was uh, with the WWE Championship at stake. And again, it was, this was more about the way that they use the cage as a weapon and just like the, the timing and just how fucking good these two workers were. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, Brett uh, would come out 
uh, on top in this one. Uh, but man, of all the Bret Hart versus uh, Owen Hart matches, and like you know, the WrestleMania match obviously was a five star all timer, but I really feel like this one is underrated, um, and arguably it's my favorite of all of the Bret Hart versus Owen Hart matches. So I wanted to make sure that this one was included on the list. And then also, obviously, Bret Hart versus the British Bulldog for the Intercontinental Championship in 1992. And arguably, this could be number one on many lists, uh, but uh, they were in Wembley Stadium, like 80,000 plus fans. And this is, you know, 1992 is back in a time where kayfabe was truly alive. Like this was the Hulk Hogan era. People were on the edge of their fucking seat. Like the crowd is insane for this match. You can talk about the emotion and the heat from the crowd and just the efforts um, of both uh, both guys. And again, um, the way that in the end, uh, Davy Boy Smith is able to counter a sunset flip and stack Bret Hart up and score a pinfall to win the championship. Man, like, those were also arguably dark times in WWE uh, when they were transitioning through those early 90s. And then, um, you know, you would lose like your Kevin Nash and Skull Hall and that, you know, you had the Dr. Isaac Yankums and uh, you, you, those kind of characters. Um, and it was very cheesy, but Bret Hart at a time where – you still had some of that going on. Again, one of the most technical wrestlers that has ever lived, um, that has ever strapped the boots, and one of the greatest of all time. And obviously, as a Canadian, like we have a special fondness uh, for the Hart family. Uh, it doesn't matter if you grow up. At, I mean, if you're in Alberta, you grew up around the Alberta area. That's just like extra. But like all of Canada, basically, like you know, we get behind um, our own. So, yeah, huge shout out um, to those two matches in particular, both at SummerSlam. Um, again, uh, the first one, uh, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart, that was in 1994. And then versus the Bulldog, that was in 1992. So, for you younger fans out there, if you have not seen those matches, those are two that you absolutely must go back and watch. In fact, I need to go back and watch them, even though I know I've seen both of those matches um, it's like, those are very early wrestling memories. I will say, uh, Bret Hart versus Bulldog. I've definitely, I, I know I've seen, uh, in my adult life as well, but it's been a minute, right? So I, that's one that I would go and watch back. And the next two on the list to wrap this up. These are, again, I just want to be very clear. This top 10 list, you guys, is my personal favorites. These are not what I think are just like, if I was just doing like technically speaking greatest SummerSlam matches of all time, I think Hart versus Bulldog probably would have been number one. I can guarantee you, you will disagree with my number one. It's a, That's why I'm prefacing this whole time that like, these are my favorites, Okay. So I do not think that number one is actually the greatest SummerSlam of all, all uh, match of all time. It's just my favorite SummerSlam match of all time. And it's the one that I've seen the most times. It's the one that I watch back the most times. Um, but number two, before we get into number one, not to spoil it, the very first TLC match in 2000 with the Hardy Boys, the Dudley Boys, and Edge and Christian. This one definitely um, not quite cemented in my memory as well as their WrestleMania TLC match at WrestleMania 17, which I would argue is the greatest uh, TLC match of all time, especially the greatest tag team TLC match of all time. Uh, but that the way that I separate it is the the 
third, the, sorry, the TLC two at WrestleMania. That's the one with all the interruptions because you had uh, each one of their mascots, basically, you could say, or managers, because you had Lita, Spike Dudley, and um, I forget who it was for. Oh, Rhino for Edge and Christian. So you had all three of them interrupting in the match as well. Um, and then you had the big spear from uh, Edge to Hardy. So that was like the TLC uh, seven, uh, 2 at WrestleMania 17. But the first one, the first one is very underrated. Absolute fucking car wreck. Still, like if there was the second greatest TLC match, you could argue it was this one. Um, and uh, the fact that it was the first one ever, uh, all the stuff they did, like just absolutely banana split uh i still will go back and like when i i also want to preface to that like when i'm trying to get casuals to watch uh wrestling these are often the matches that i'm having them watch i'm like hey you know what let's watch tlc one and two back to back because it's the same characters it tells a story. It's an easy story to tell. Hey, they were fighting for the tag team titles. This was the first. They were all up and coming tag teams. And this was the first TLC match that had ever uh, happened. And the second one happened at WrestleMania. So let's just watch them back to back. It's like a beautiful little movie. And the thing is, I think a lot of wrestling, uh, non-wrestling fans, sorry, when they see like... Um, you know, the the just straight up like wrestling, um, like Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit, that is impressive to some people. Um, you know, it's like in uh, UFC, like really high level grappling and submission game. Like there are always going to be fans of that, but that is a little bit more of an uh, uh, a learned and knowledgeable fan. Like that's, that's not what's going to draw in casuals, all right? You want to bring in the casual? It's it's the big knockouts for UFC. And what that is, is these fucking car wreck matches. So usually, if I'm like, if, my, if I have a friend that's like, hey, I've never watched wrestling before. What should I watch? I'm like, all right, Hell in a Cell, Mankind vs. Undertaker. That's uh, number one. You got to watch that because that's literally like the man almost died. Please watch it. Uh, number two <coughs> is TLC one and two, uh, and like I, I'll, you can throw them on anytime for anyone, and it's always impressive. And I think again, what also breaks the illusion, and what I love is you have Edge and Christian kind of representing the classic version of what people view as wrestlers. But then when you look at the other two teams, when you look at the Hardy Boys. Uh, who were uh, representative of kind of like that early alternative punk rock Nirvana crossed with like vampirism vibe. And then you had the Dudley boys in the fucking full camo. It was like all of a sudden you had all these different sets of characters that all exist within this same universe in an absolute human fucking demolition derby. Like, there is almost no way, like, you you almost have to hate fun <laughs> or just be someone who's just, like, completely, like, you just completely disinterested in any kind of, like, violence or, or, you know, entertainment whatsoever to just not be in on those style of matches is what it is. So that's why, uh, like I said, when I'm starting out, like, complete casuals that have never watched wrestling before... I'll usually start with, you know, like I said, TLC 1 and 2. Just put them on together. Boom. There you go, baby. But we've delayed long enough. We'll get into number one. I know, like I said, everyone's going to disagree. If I was doing a just a top 10 of what are the best matches, this wouldn't be number one. But this is my favorite SummerSlam match of all time. In fact, I think I'm going to watch it after while I'm having dinner. But it's the fatal four-way for the WWE Championship in 2017 between Brock Lesnar, Braun Strowman, Roman Reigns, 
and Samoa Joe. So again, you want to talk about just pure chaos and destruction? That is exactly what this match was. I loved every minute of this match. There were so many good things. Um, and this is one that I remember like uh, pretty well. Like at, at the time, too, Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns had had their insane rivalry. Um, you had the rivalry between Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. You had Samoa Joe and Brock Lesnar had a rivalry. And Samoa Joe was just out here choking out Roman Reigns at any chance he got. Just choking out everybody. And Braun Strowman, the monster among men, just an absolute human wrecking machine. And you had multiple standoffs. Like you had the standoff between Braun Strowman and Brock Lesnar. You had Brock Lesnar and Samoa Joe. You had Samoa Joe and Roman Reigns. You had Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar. Oh, man. And just the pure, again, chaos and destruction of this match. Braun Strowman in particular, MVP of this match. Whipping office chairs at people. That's one of my favorite spots. Uh, he, as you can see, he put Brock Lesnar through not one, but two announce tables and then flipped. And then he flipped an announce table on top of Lesnar. Made it look like he killed the man. Paul Heyman was like, oh my God. They took him out on a stretcher. Brock was out of it for a bit. And then you had, and then all of a sudden, uh, Brock pulled, uh, if y'all remember way back in the day, this actually happened where it was uh, the TLC match, random TLC match that was on SmackDown when Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit were the champions. Benoit got fucked up halfway through the match and then disappears for like the whole match. And then he comes out and just comes out to basically grab the title. Uh, that was Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar comes back, obviously came back kicking some ass, though, throwing F5s around. Ultimately, Brock would retain his title, which honestly, I, that was the only thing I thought uh, was kind of the wrong move, uh, just with how with how much he had been destroyed and intimidated by Braun Strowman. It, it had been so long since they had Brock Lesnar really chasing a title and a guy that he couldn't physically impose himself on, um, where he would kind of have to overcome uh, Braun Strowman in a one-on-one -on -one match. I thought that was the only missed opportunity was I would have put that strap on Braun, and, especially with all the, the destruction of Brock Lesnar in the match. Like, have Lesnar come back out, but have him ultimately not be able to take out Braun, um, put the belt on Braun, and then you, have a, you build a match, Braun versus Brock one-on-one, -on -one, which they would eventually have that match. Um, that I that I think it was actually off of this. Still, they built to the one on one, but then in that match, uh, if y'all uh, again, people remember that like I think Braun Strowman like fucked up a spot, or he accidentally kneed Lesnar in the face or something, and Lesnar gave him a, a receipt where he punched him for real. So I don't know if there was just like backstage heat or if uh, that just didn't work out, but. Brock would end up picking up that win too. Uh, and then that feud just kind of fizzled out. Uh, and we never really got like a true beefy feud of meat on meat with Brock versus Braun. But this match still uh, stands uh, alone in my mind as, again, my personal favorite SummerSlam match of all time. I totally understand if it's not anybody else's favorite, but. For me, this is just one that I always think of. Maybe it's a little bit too of uh, revisionist history because it's uh, probably one of the most recent matches on the list. But, uh, you know, again, personal favorite. So, hey, let me know what your personal favorite is. Drop it in the comments. Put your What is your favorite SummerSlam match of all time? Let me know. Uh, let me know how stupid I am for picking uh, the Fatal 4-Way as my favorite. Uh, if you guys want to see different topics, uh, if you have ideas for the show, some questions, ask me anything, you can always hit me up at Jack Loose now on all my socials. You can uh, send questions to worstsportschannel at gmail.com. But until the next time, uh, oh, and just one thing, hopefully we should be back live next week, assuming that my schedule is back to normal. But yeah, 
Uh, otherwise, until the next time, I'll catch all of you guys on the flip side. My positive contact results in affirmative impact. Never pull the rats on raps. I'm never primitive, but then I'm ballistic, vicious, characteristics. I read the terrible potency of ascetic genes, yo. Ever the eat them seeds at a short and never speed. Some of the beers like some of the rings of blades and grease in your bare feet. I see your fucking colleagues misprize you very much to your dismay. So today, I can say you won't be running away. Hold your tail between your legs. I'm gonna advocate when you fail before stakes. I'll take a hacksaw to you, cockeyed, mumble rap, slack jaws. Leave you shredded on a side like some coleslaw. The double time with that clothesline from hell. Like Bradshaw, I'm toxic like septic shot. A dying breed like cataract.